Hi everyone, welcome to the second lecture of Economics 2355. Uh, today we're going to be talking about convolutional neural networks. And so this is a good opportunity to also uh, talk a little bit about the history of deep learning. And so the mathematical concepts behind deep learning actually go back quite a long time. A handful of researchers first started thinking about deep learning in the 1980s. I think people at the time thought it was, you know, some kind of esoteric theoretical thing. Um, in discussing at a conference why deep learning did not take off um, back in the 1980s or even the 1990s or 2000s, uh, Jeff Hinton, um, who's one of the founders of deep learning, put it bluntly. He said, our labeled data sets were thousands of times too small. Our computers were millions of times too slow. We initialized the weights in a stupid way, um, and we used the wrong type of nonlinearity. So if you move forward to 2012, uh, the deep learning revolution is about to begin. Um, and if we go back to the points on the previous slide, um, thanks to the availability of GPU compute, um, there was actually kind of the computational power um, to optimize a deep model. Um, and many of the advances that we're going to see uh, with convolutional neural networks are concentrated around an image classification contest um, called ImageNet. Um, ImageNet now is a benchmark data set that consists of 14 million images in their classes. Um, it was smaller at that time, but still pretty substantial. And it's still the data set that largely drives um, pre-training and vision applications. And so if you work in the vision field, you're going to hear about ImageNet over and over and over again. Um, and so by this time, there was a labeled data set um, that was, you know, actually large enough to train a model. Um, the objective in the ImageNet competition was to predict each image's predetermined class. Um, and the other two points um, that were mentioned before initializing the weights in a stupid way, using the wrong kind of nonlinearity, we're going to come to those points um, in time as well. Um, but before we delve into um, the early deep learning advances through CNNs, uh, we need to take a moment to understand uh, image classification, what it is, uh, what's the data structure of an image, as well as the benchmarks that this literature evaluates on. So I'm going to start out by talking briefly about image benchmark data sets. Um, and so kind of the first thing you need to know is that when you read the deep learning literature, uh, much of the literature is organized around benchmark data sets, and papers are trying to beat uh, the existing state of the art on these benchmarks. And so there's benchmarks for all sorts of different tasks. Um, you know, there's a, a website called Papers with Code where you can see the leaderboards for a variety of benchmark tasks. Um, and so um, in the image classification and object detection space, um, there's a few main data sets. Um, so there's a data set called CIFAR-10. It has about 60,000 images in 10 different classes. Um, with a class image, um, with a class label for each image. So this is a car, this is a horse. Um, there's 6,000 images per class. So this is a smaller and older data set. Then there's ImageNet, um, which as I mentioned today is 14 million images. Um, over 1 million of those have bounding boxes uh, for objects. Um, and that's going to be the main data set for advancements of this literature and still for uh, largely for pre-training today. Um, and then this is not relevant to this lecture, um, but if you do work on object detection and when we get to that point, um, there is a data set called Microsoft Coco, um, which is an object detection, um, segmentation and captioning data set. All right. Um, and so the architectures that we will see in this lecture were developed for the ImageNet challenges in 2012 to 2016. I think they actually stopped the ImageNet challenge after that point because essentially um, the models were better than human performance. Um, the, mis you know, the mistakes they were making were mostly labeling errors in the data set, um, although there's continued to be advances in this literature. Um, some people argue that data sets like ImageNet are even more important to the advancement of deep learning uh, than the model architectures uh, that have been developed. Um, so ImageNet is a, is a pretty big deal. All right, um, so now I wanna say a word about image classification. 
Um, and before we get into neural networks, I want to talk about kind of the simplest possible model you could use and why that's um, very likely to be inadequate. Um, so suppose you want to classify images with just a linear classifier. Um, and so a classifier is a function that combines your inputs with a set of weights, w, to produce a vector with the class probabilities. Um, and so a linear classifier just predicts the class um, probabilities by multiplying your inputs by a set of weights. Um, so suppose we have some very low resolution, 32 by 32 by 3 images. The 3 is for the three color channels um, in an image. And we want to classify which of 10 classes each of the images belongs to. So is it a horse? Is it a car, etc.? And so if we think about kind of the dimensions of this problem, uh, the class probabilities are going to be a 10 by 1 vector. Um, they give us a probability for each of those 10 classes. And so um, that's the size of our output. And if we restack our inputs into a column vector, um, it will have um, for um, each of those images um, a dimension of 3072, um, because that's how many pixels there are in a 32 by 32 image. And hence the weight matrix um, must be 10 by 3072 to yield the probabilities for the 10 output classes. And so what that means is that we can think of this weight matrix as consisting of a single template, the same size as the input image 32 by 32 by 3, um, for each of the 10 classes. Um, so each image will be compared pixel by pixel to each of the template filters to assess the class probabilities. Um, you know, here's an example um, with a, you know, a simplified uh, image. Um, and so if you do this on CIFAR 10, right, the data set with 10 um, classes, um, and you look at those weight matrices, you can see that literally like the weight matrices are like a filter um, for each of the objects. And so you can see it looking for a car on the left. You can see it looking for a horse on the right or a frog uh, next to that. You can see the outline of a deer. Um, and so what's going to be the problem with this? Well, you know, the horse could be facing left or right or to the front or to the back. It could be in very small. It could be very large. It could be in all different parts of the image. It could look different. Um, and so you can just see that it's like, even for a very simple task, which is that there's only 10 possible op, um, like types of images and you want to predict which one it is, um, like, it, it's just actually pretty um, complicated. You're going to need far more than a single filter effectively to compare each image to. And so if you try to do this with a linear classifier, it's going to be incredibly brittle. All right. Um, so the final thing I want to mention before we talk about classification with neural networks is uh, classification loss functions. So we can think of neural networks as Legos where we stack together different types of Legos to do different tasks. And so if our task is image classification, we can just stack the classification layer or classification layers on top of the neural features extractor. And so the first type of uh, classification that people often use is called the SVM loss. Um, and so what this loss does is to sum over the incorrect classes. So suppose that we have three classes um, and they receive scores of three, negative seven, and 2.5, kind of in that last layer of activations in your neural network. Um, and the first class is the correct one. Um, and so to compute the SVM loss, um, it equals the max of zero or negative seven minus three plus one. So we're comparing that second category to the correct one plus the max of zero and then 2.5 minus three plus one. And so for the second class, the score is much lower than the true class, but the loss doesn't care how much as long as the difference is greater than some threshold. But for the third class, even though the score is less than the true class, 
there's still going to be a loss associated with it because it doesn't exceed the threshold. And here we've set this threshold to one, um, and you can show that this is without loss of generality, right? Because you could set it to something else and the weights would just scale accordingly um, on, your, on, um, on your network. And so this is a visualization of the hinge loss or SVM. The other common um, loss is softmax. And so softmax takes a vector of arbitrary real valued scores that are kind of the activations of the neurons in the last layer of your network. And it squashes that to a vector of values between zero and one that's sum to one. And so you can interpret this as the normalized probability assigned to the correct label given the image um, however, kind of an important caveat is that while these are oftentimes interpreted as probabilities, how peaky those probabilities are can depend on how you regularize the loss function. So these are not probabilities in the statistical sense. Um, so both SVM and softmax are used pretty frequently. Um, once you get the right answer above some threshold, SVM doesn't care if you push the score for the correct class up higher. Whereas in contrast, um, softmax cares about pushing probability of the correct class to one. And so this means that early in training, your accuracy can jump suddenly without much change in your loss if you're using softmax. So SVM is a more local objective. You could think of that as either a bug or a feature. You know, you spend most effort distinguishing cars from trucks versus cars from cats. In practice, um, these two losses tend to yield very similar results. All right, um, so one more kind of piece of background before we uh, launch into talking about um, the development of different CNN architectures. Um, so we need to introduce image data and what convolutions are. And so if you guys watch the introduction to neural network videos or you're just familiar with neural networks from uh, previous coursework, um, in the plain vanilla neural network, all neurons in one layer are connected to all neurons in the next. So this is called a fully connected network. Um, and this implies that there's a lot of parameters as the size of the network grows. Um, and a network like this fails to capture the structures inherent in much of the data that we'd like to process. And so how do we as humans process images? Um, the spatial, spatial structure of the images is key. We interpret pixels in the context of other pixels around them. And so we see kind of that something is um, a line um, because of the lighter shading around it. And so the vanilla neural network is devoid of this sort of spatial structure. Um, and that's why like if you were to use kind of a vanilla network to do things like recognize digits, it isn't capable of detecting edges, etc. cetera. Um, however, it is straightforward to build this spatial structure into a network and doing so substantially reduces the number of parameters that we need to estimate. Okay, and so we do this um, with convolutions. Um, so think of each pixel in the input image as a neuron Convolutions are a spatial filter that you slide over the image and you take the dot product between the input pixels and the weights in that filter. You sum them up and pass them through a nonlinearity to compute the associated neuron in the next layer. So an important point to make here is what kind of function are we gonna use for that nonlinearity? Um, and so, um, you know, getting this right was important to kickstarting the deep learning revolution. Go back to the first slide of this lecture. Jeff Hinton said we were using the wrong kind of nonlinearity. Um, and so people kind of in the older deep learning literature going back to the 1990s um, often used a sigmoid activation function. Um, and so the sigmoid activation function, um, you know, takes the um, uh, takes the uh, output and squishes it between zero and one. So what's going to be the problems with this uh, function? Um, 
if you look at it, it saturates across most of the domain. And so there's a small range um, of the domain where um, it's changing a lot, um, but in most of the domain, it's saturated. This flat derivative makes it difficult to improve the weights through gradient descent. Um, and this can make the vanishing gradient problem get worse as the number of layers in the network increases. And the most difficult thing in optimizing a neural networking, you're going to see that later in this lecture, is how when you're back propping through a very deep network, how do you keep your gradients from vanishing? Moreover, it's very sensitive to small changes over part of its range, which also complicates training. It's not zero centered, and then importantly, it's also costly to compute, um, which matters when you're training a huge neural network. Um, uh, the inverse hyperbolic tangent, um, you're gonna see that it has, you know, it is zero centered, but it has otherwise kind of um, similar um, problems to the sigmoid. And so a big advancement with the start of the deep learning revolution was to use, <clears throat> was to use a different type of nonlinearity called the rectified linear unit activation, or ReLU. And so linearity means that the slope doesn't saturate when x gets large. It doesn't have the severe vanishing gradient problem suffered by other activation functions like sigmoid. Um, when training on a reasonably sized batch, um, there will usually be some data points given positive values to any given node. Um, so when I say when training on a batch, I mean you're going to feed kind of uh, multiple images um, into your network at the same time for training. Um, and so usually there'll be some data points given positive values to any given node. Um, so the average derivative is rarely close to zero, which allows gradient descent to keep progressing. Um, you can't output true zeros, uh, which is better in estimating a sparse network. Um, and um, finally, it's very fast to compute. It's about six times um, faster to compute uh, than sigmoid. The problem with ReLU is that you can get dead ReLUs, um, which are neurons that get stuck on the negative side and always yield zero gradient, no matter the input. Um, as long as you're not negative for all images in the batch, as I said, it will yield a positive average gradient. Um, so this can happen when the learning rate is too large um, or with very negative biases, um, if, you kind of, if you initialize your network in the wrong way. There's other functions, leaky relu, exponential linear unit, we'll see another one um, when we get the, to the transformer, um, but it's just important to have in mind that we, when we say like with a neural network, um, you know, we're taking the dot product to things, summing up and then passing it through a nonlinearity. Um, this is essentially what is meant by that. Okay, so that was an aside on, uh, on the nonlinearity, but let's go back to convolution. Um, so as I said, think of convolutions as spatial filters or weight matrices that connect layers of the network. Um, and so you see an example here where you have a four by four uh, spatial filter and it's being slid across the image. Um, so the filters can have different sizes. Um, three by three pixels, five by five, and seven by seven are common. Uh, the filters can have different strides, so how much you move it at each step, um, and different zero paddings of image edges to control the number of neurons in an output layer. So for example, uh, with a three by three convolution that you zero pad by one uh, to maintain the size with a stride of one. Um, if you have a five by fil five filter, you need to, um, in a stride of one, you need to zero pad by two, etc. cetera. Um, uh, these spatial filters always extend through the full depth of the input. Um, so suppose you have a 25 by 25 by three input. So that's just a 25 by 25 pixel RGB image. Um, and you apply um, a five by five by three filter with a stride of one um, and zero pad. 
then your output layer is gonna be 25 by 25 by one. And so this is important, like it's applying through all channels of the input. Um, in practice, you would never apply just one set of filters, right? We just talked about this at the beginning of the lecture, that's never gonna be enough to capture the complexity of your input data. Um, so suppose you have an input image, it's a 25 by 25 pixel color image, um, and you apply nine, two three by three filters with a stride of one, um, then that would yield a 25 by 25 by 92 output layer. All right, so different filters or different weight matrices will extract different sorts of features. Um, and this kind of, this makes sense. You can imagine we need different filters to pull out different features like colors, edges, um, as well as to address intra-class variation. So you can have a horse facing right or left or forwards and you need um, filters that are looking for horses in all those different positions. A three by three filter with weights equal to one ninth would take a simple average. You know, a Gaussian filter would put more weight on the middle pixels. Um, other types of filters can pull out edges and a variety of other input features, uh, sorry, a variety of other image features. Um, and so in the air before deep learning um, in image processing, um, people would often hand engineer these filters. Um, and it turns out that this is just very brittle um, and also very labor intensive. Um, and so with deep learning, um, we use um, empirical examples to estimate these filters. And that's going to just greatly outperform uh, trying to engineer these features um, ourselves. Okay, another th term that you should know because it comes up in um, CNNs is pooling. Um, so pooling is used to downsample images, but pooling differs from convolution and that pooling preserves the depth. Um, and so, um, you know, it's essentially just downsizing the resolution of your input. Um, so the most common approach is max pooling, which simply takes the max pixel value in a filter um, as it is moved across an image, um, preserving the depth of that image. Okay, so what are the differences between convolution and pooling? Uh, convolution involves parameters that you estimate through back propagation. Pooling doesn't have any parameters. You just take, for example, the max pixel value within the filter. Multiple convolution filters are typically applied to an input layer to extract different features. And they can do that while down sampling as well. Uh, whereas max pooling can be thought of as a single filter that extracts the max value. Uh, convolutions are applied over the depth of the image. Um, you know, so um, if you have an 11, 11 um, by three filter applied to a 227 by 227 by three image, that will yield a 55 by 55 by one output. Whereas if you did down sampling, that's gonna yield a 55 by 55 by three output with uh, max pooling. All right, um, so that's uh, the basic background for uh, CNNs. Uh, hopefully that made um, sense and now we can get to the exciting part of the lecture. Okay, um, and so this is a graph um, from the ImageNet competition um, and um, it's showing um, the air rate um, made in each year of the contest. Um, and so you started in 2010, 2011. This is before the deep learning revolution and people are um, doing this contest with features engineering. Then you move forward to 2012 um, and um, you see that the error rate just falls dramatically. Um, and that is um, done with a neural network and then it keeps falling and falling and falling as uh, neural networks improve. And so if you look at the error rate, 
um, and plot it against the depth of the network. Now time is going in the opposite direction um, on, um, on this graph. Um, you can see that getting more and more accurate is associated with having deeper and deeper networks. Um, and so this is another um, graph that's showing you um, top one accuracy um, and um, the size of the, um, of the circle is the size of the model. Um, and then on the x-axis it has the number of operations. All right, um, and so um, the paper that won ImageNet in 2012 is called AlexNet, and it was the first CNN-based paper to do so. It lowered the error rate from 26.2 to 15.3, which is pretty dramatic, and is one of the most cited papers in deep learning. Um, it's called AlexNet because that was the name of the, um, of the first author on the paper. All right, so what does AlexNet do? Um, it's an eight layer network. Um, and first it does convolution, um, max pooling and normalization. Um, second, um, convolution, max pooling, normalization. Um, third layer is convolution, fourth layer convolution, five layer convolution, and then does max pooling. Um, and then there's three fully connected layers. Um, and this is the details of the architecture. Um, so in ImageNet, the inputs are 227 by 227 by three. Um, and then you see it applying um, uh, filters that as you move into the depth of the network, um, the resolution gets lower, um, but the depth uh, gets, uh, gets deeper. And so you're applying all these different filters to be able to pull out different features. Okay, um, so let's talk about AlexNet in a little bit more detail. Um, so it was built upon Ideas in Linnet, um, which was developed by um, Jan LeCun, um, who, um, uh, along with Hinton, who was the senior author on this paper, is one of the founders of deep learning. Um, AlexNet was an early adopter of ReLU, um, which allowed the network to be trained much, much faster, meaning that you could have a much larger network. Um, it made heavy use of data augmentation. Um, it used dropout, which we'll talk about um, later to avoid overfitting, and that helped to improve performance. Um, data augmentation can also be thought of as a way to avoid overfitting. Again, we'll come back to that point um, in a later lecture. Uh, it was one of the first papers to leverage the massive um, parallel processing power of GPUs, which allowed it to train um, a deep neural net. Okay, so that's AlexNet, which is really the pioneering paper. Um, next, you have um, VGG. And so the important idea in uh, VGG is to have a deeper network. Um, so you can see it has more layers than um, AlexNet. AlexNet had eight, I think, and VGG had a version with 16 and a version with 19. Um, and it did that without completely blowing up the size of the network by using smaller filters. Um, and so it used uh, three by three filters um, with periodic two by two max pooling. Whereas if you go back to, um, uh, if you go back to AlexNet, you can see it's using much, much larger filters, 55 by 55, 27 by 27, 13 by 13, six by six. And so why, um, okay, well, before I get into why that worked, this is just a useful visualization of the architecture. And so you see um, that it's um, being put, um, you know, um, input into the network. And again, just like with AlexNet, um, as it goes through the, net, uh, the, the CNN, the resolution goes down, but the depth um, increases. And, um, at the end, you still have these fully connected layers, um, like AlexNet, it's using ReLU. And then at the end, there's a thousand classes in ImageNet. Um, there's a different version of ImageNet with more, I think 14,000 classes, but that wasn't used at this time. 
Um, and so it just does a soft max to get those thousand class probabilities. Okay, so the key insight is if you use smaller filters in a deeper network, you have the same effective receptive field as using larger filters in a shallower network. So why is that true? Um, suppose you are using three by three filters throughout with a stride of one. So in the first layer, it has a receptive field of three. In the second layer, the effective receptive field is five because each of the neurons it is applied to contains information from the neighboring pixels already. And a three by three filter applied to this output is similarly looking at seven by seven in the input layer. Hence, you have the same receptive field as a seven by seven layer, but more nonlinearity because you're applying ReLU at each layer. And that's gonna give you kind of a more flexible, um, a more flexible function. Um, and you also have fewer parameters. Um, so this is the VGG architecture. Um, and I think here it's, um, yeah, it's showing you um, the dimensions um, at each layer of the network. So you start out with your 224 by 224 input, um, and then you're down sampling and getting more depth. And you still have those fully connected layers at the end. And you can, if you look at this, actually a lot of the parameters come from those fully connected layers at the end. So you see 102 million plus uh, from the first fully connected layer, 16.7 so million from the second one. So these fully connected layers are really, really blowing up uh, the size of your network. And you remember that from this graph back here where VGG is huge. All right. Um, the next um, the next model to come along and when ImageNet is called um, GoogleNet or Inception, obviously a, a, a play on LinNet, which was kind of the original <laughs> inspiration for convolutional neural networks, but just uh, way ahead of its time back in the 90s. And um, so an important innovation of GoogleNet is it gets rid of the fully connected layers, and that's going to save a lot of parameters. Um, and its key feature is the inception model, which is a local network topology at each layer. And so the idea of the inception module is to apply several different feature operations in parallel and then concatenate them together. And so if you were to just do this naively, the number of parameters could quickly blow up. Um, pooling, um, preserves the depth, so at each layer the feature's depth can only grow. Okay, so how can we make inception computationally feasible? Um, the key insight of this paper is um, to use bottleneck layers that project features maps to lower dimensions using a one-by-one -one convolution, and that preserves the spatial dimension while reducing the depth by taking a dot product at each spatial location. Because remember, when you apply a convolution, it applies through all um, layers of um, your input. And so if you use a one by one convolution, you know, that's just a filter size of one, you're just averaging across the, um, the depth of your input. And so um, if you have a 56 by 56 by 64 input, um, and you apply 32 one by one um, convolutions, then you get a 56 by 56 by 32 output. Um, and so now you have kind of a, a, much, um, a much smaller input for the next layer. So what the inception module does is to apply um, one by one convolutions of depth 64 before three by three and five by five convolutional ops after pooling. Um, and this reduces the number of convolutional operations substantially um, and um, reduces the depth of the output. So what's the intuition for why this might be a sensible thing to do? Uh, you do lose some information by taking a linear combination of the feature layers with the one-by-one one convolution, uh, but there's some redundancy in them. 
and the additional nonlinearity from applying ReLU after the one by one convolution is beneficial. Okay, um, another important point here is getting rid of the fully connected layers. Uh, so suppose at the second to last layer you have um, 1024 7 by 7 features maps. And you want to use this to predict a 1 by 10,024 layer of class probabilities. Um, so this implies 51.3 million weights in a fully connected network. Um, and so what Google, did, what Google Net does is to apply global average pooling at the end of the network by averaging each of the 1,024 seven by seven features maps into a one by one features map to produce a 10,024 by one output. How many parameters does this have? Zero. Okay, so you just saved yourself from estimating 51.3 million parameters. Um, and even better, the authors found um, that this improved top one accuracy by reducing overfitting um, because overfitting is potentially a, like a problem with these fully connected layers that have a ton of parameters. So you just save 51.3 million parameters and improved accuracy, um, which is uh, definitely a win. Um, and so this is what the full architecture looks like. They're able to get up to 22 layers um, so the initial models are just doing some vanilla convolution and pooling layers. Um, you also see the yellow boxes there. Um, so those are auxiliary layers used for training, not for testing or inference. And the intuition is that the middle layers of the network should do reasonably well at classification as well. And so you have these auxiliary classification outputs in the middle of the network to get more gradient training injected at the earlier lay layers to try to avoid your, grant, your gradients from vanishing to zero when you try to backprop through this network that has 22 layers. Okay, and so you might kind of look at this full architecture and think, well, like, but you know, why did they, why did they choose this specifically? You know, I kind of, understand the intuition about, you know, needing those auxiliary training layers so your gradients don't vanish and why getting rid of the fully connected layers was good, but why, why the specific configuration? Um, and so, you know, the intuition makes sense, but in terms of, you know, this specific configuration, I think it's important to keep in mind that obviously the author of Google Net is uh, people at Google, and they have massive compute and can do very extensive cross-validation. And this is what happened to work best. Um, and so, you know, uh, like the first um, uh, CNN uh, to, um, to when ImageNet was made by uh, Hendon's group at Toronto, and as I mentioned, kind of the, the earlier LayNet was a Lacoon, and so kind of the early ideas were made by academics, but kind of as you move forward in these competitions, you're seeing them won by like people um, who are at places like Google or um, you know what at the time was Facebook AI research um, because they have access to a lot of compute. And so they can afford to run a bunch of class val uh, of cross validation and see what happens to work best. And they're also, as I said, they made important advancements. But you know why this specific architecture? There's no, like you couldn't prove, you know, like why this is best. It's just they tried different things, and this like this worked the best. Okay. So none of the models that I have showed you thus far would you use conceivably today. Um, I'm just showing these for sort of, um, for understanding the evolution of the literature, whereas ResNet, um, you know, you might conceivably and reasonably um, still use it today to do image tasks. There's other architectures that have been developed since then that maybe have a bit of an edge, but actually for a lot of things, ResNet is pretty good. Um, ResNet can have up to 152 layers. Um, and so remember, we just talked about how GoogleNet was like, wow, 22 layers. Um, and ResNet just blows that out of the water. It had a 3.57% top five error. It swept all benchmarks and ImageNet, not just for classification, but also for localizing objects, detecting objects, 
Um, it also won uh, the COCO uh, contest for object detection and segmentation. So it's just beating out everything. Um, and so the key insight of ResNet is um, showing in uh, the following graph, like the key problem that they need to solve. Um, and so in a normal convolutional neural network, can we just keep adding more and more layers to improve accuracy? Um, and the answer there is no. Um, and so here you see plotted um, the training error um, um, and the number of iterations in training. Um, and you see a 20 layer network in yellow and a 56 layer network in red. Um, and um, then you see the same thing for the test data on the right. Um, and so if you were just doing worse in test with the deeper network, you might think that that was because of overfitting. But when you're doing worst in the test data and in the train data, which the model saw during training um, with a deeper network, that has to be because of an optimization problem. Um, Okay, so what is that optimization problem? This is, I've already mentioned this a few times in this discussion. Um, and so if you didn't have an optimization problem, um, deep neural networks should be able to do just as well as shallower networks. You could just take the learned layers from the shallow model and set the additional layers to the identity mapping, right? So there has to be an optimization problem because if there wasn't, like there's, you, you shouldn't do worse with a deeper network. Um, and that optimization problem is vanishing gradients, um, which I, as I said, I already hinted at a few times during this lecture, that's what those kind of auxiliary layers in the middle of Google Net were trying to do was inject some signal in the middle of this, you know, deep 22 layer network um, so that the gradients wouldn't vanish. So remember, we optimize neural networks by bat propagating to earlier layers, and repeated multiplication can make the gradient infinitely small. If the gradient's infinitely small, then obviously learning is very slow um, because you're not updating much at each iteration. And in the extreme, if the gradient is zero, you can't update the parameters at all. And so the Google Nets auxiliary loss layers try to add some supervision in this model to solve this problem, but they still only like kind of solve this problem. They can't get deeper than 22 layers. Um, so this doesn't scale well to even deeper networks. And so what does ResNet do? Instead of choosing weights to fit some desired function, H of X, when you have your input layer X, the inside of ResNet is choose the weights to fit the residual f of x, which is just h of x minus x. Then you can construct the output as f of x plus x. And if you choose weights that are zero, h of x just equals x. And you should be able to do at least as well as the shallower net because then you just learn the identity function. Um, all right. And so it seems almost like, you know, an obvious um, insight um, ex post, but obviously it was it was not at the time, and a lot of smart people worked on this for for quite a while. Um, this this insight had actually um, come up in other parts um, of neural networks in the past, um, and we'll see that later in the course. But it was kind of really the first time that. Um, somebody had this, this insight um, in the CompNet literature. So these residual mappings make it easier to learn an identity function. Um, and they help to address the vanishing gradient problem because if you just backprop through the identity function, uh, the gradient would just be multiplied by one. Um, and Part of the intuition here is if you have a very deep network, you should just need small tweaks at each layer, or perhaps you don't even need anything at all. And so kind of by making it easy to learn this identity function or something very close to it, you should be able to do quite well. Um, residual blocks have become the elementary building block um, 
for almost all CNNs today. We'll also see that you need these residual connections in the transformer. Basically, these are um, the, uh, the key to being able to optimize very deep, uh, very large models. Um, so this uh, visualizes the ResNet architecture, and you can see the, the residual uh, connections shown in there with the arrows. Every residual block has two layers of three by three filters. So remember going back to sort of um, to VGG, it's still using three by three filters. Um, they periodically double the number of filters and downsample spatially using a stride of two. And um, as in Google, um, they take the lesson of having no fully connected layers at the end. They just do global average pooling of uh, the last convolutional layer. Um, to get those um, uh, class probabilities. All right, um, so this is what the, uh, oh, sorry. So um, so there's ResNets of different depths. Uh, for ResNet 50 and above, they use bottleneck layers to improve efficiency, um, which is um, akin to GoogleNet. Um, and so in this case, you see there's a 28 by 28 by 256 input. Um, apply a one by one convolution, um, 64 of those, and then do three by three convolutions, 64 of those, and then do a one by one convolution again, 256 of those. Um, and that is allowing you um, to keep the same sized output and to apply this residual function. Okay, so there's three central properties of GoogleNet. So the bottlenecks to reduce dimensions uh, before the conv layers, and we just saw uh, the bottlenecks here. Um, shortcuts to go deep. Um, in the case of GoogleNet, that was auxiliary training layers. In the case of ResNet, that's the residual connections. And then it also has multiple branches, extracting features of various sizes by using multiple filters in parallel. So ResNet has the first two. Um, it doesn't have the third. Um, so it has depth, but not width. That led to ResNext. Um, you know, in our experience using ResNet 101 versus ResNext 101, like it doesn't really matter. Um, so I don't think that that last point is, is super important, but there is a ResNet that has um, that last point as shown here. Um, so this is just a recap. Um, of what we talked about, and you can see it kind of all um, summed up in this figure. All right, so um, ResNet is 2015. Obviously, that's like, you know, ancient history and deep learning, although, as I said, it's still actually like a pretty reasonable thing to use. Um, and so what do we see after that? Um, we see um, some vision transformer backbones, which we're gonna talk about in a couple of weeks. Um, which is kind of a very, a very different architecture um, that's akin to um, the architecture from the transformer that also revolutionized NLP. Um, so that's the orange. And then something called ConvNext, um, which is a convolutional neural network for the 2020s is the title of the paper. Um, and essentially what ConvNext does is it starts with a ResNet and then it iteratively applies on uh, some of the lessons that we've learned through um, VITs for image classification um, and gets a somewhat modified um, version of ResNet that performs very well. Um, and so using ConvNext would be a very reasonable thing to do. Um, we find essentially equivalent performance um, on some tasks that we've tried to, to VITs. I'm not gonna talk about what ConvNext does right now because it's not gonna make any sense if you don't know something about VITs, um, but I'll come back to ConvNext um, after we talk about VITs. Um, the other thing that I didn't mention here but that you might wanna keep in mind for your own research um, is that there's also um, smaller models out there. So in particular, there's a model called MobileNet um, which is a CNN meant to be run on mobile phones. It only has about 9 million parameters, whereas ConvNext Tiny, um, so the small ConvNext backbone has over 100 million parameters. Um, 
And we actually find that for supervised tasks, like it does not quite as well, but it does like pretty well. And using MobileNet might be really convenient for you because it's much smaller, which means it's much cheaper to train. Um, and so that's just something to keep in mind and kind of we can discuss more of uh, these different models in class. When we get to vision transformers, we can discuss um, VITs versus um, ComNets and the kind of pros and cons of using, um, using different models. Um, and so that's it for convolutional neural networks. And I'm really looking forward to discussing this um, with everyone in class on Tuesday. Thank you.